review the causes, as we know, of neonatal seizures, discuss how they present, which is somewhat different than older children and adults, certainly, with seizures, and uh, go through some of the treatment options we currently have, and with a strong upfront concern that we do not have adequate treatments because we have long-term problems with this patient population. So introduction, this is the neurologist definition of what a seizure is, um, and in this age group it's the same, and that there's some observable clinical alteration of behavior. You can say someone is having a seizure, I see something, and then you can correlate that with electrical EEG study, electroencephalogram, if one is running at the time of that seizure. So it's both a practical definition as well as a functional definition about what is a seizure. And I'm going through a little at length here because we argue, as neurologists even, about whether something is a seizure or not. And even with the EEG running, we're still not always sure. I'll show examples we're quite sure, but there is, again, a lot of opportunity here for learning. Because this is neonatal seizures, it's, of course, restricted to the neonatal period, the first 44 weeks or so. And this is a relatively common problem. I'll show you a graph on the next slide showing all seizures throughout lifespan. In this group, we usually see them not only in the first week of life, but usually the first day of life is a typical reason for a consultation by a pediatric neurologist in the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, I mentioned here that it's often, usually, when I get called at least, a sign of some recent brain injury that then causes seizures, but at least the lawyers in the United States like to think that it's always that's the cause and someone did something wrong, and that is certainly not the case. So there's many different causes, but if you have acute explosive onset of seizures, you do worry about hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, which we'll spend some time talking about. So here's we're all on this graph, um, your incidence of seizures essentially on here. And look at the huge increase, or the huge um, incidence in the most youngest group. And then it all goes down, and we're all probably enjoying this period of our life. And as you get older, it goes up again, but all for very different reasons. And this huge spike in the youngest population is really the neonatal seizures we'll talk about. So I don't expect people to be able to go through all this. And I'm happy, by the way, for anyone who liked these slides in the future, just email me and I'll send them to you. Um, but the different causes by different time periods can help you restrict what the differential diagnosis is. And again, the first one I list in the first day of life, again, is HIE, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. We always think infections, and this group is excellent at looking and treating for infections, such as meningitis or encephalitis. Various bleeding is a high cause of neonatal seizures as well. And then the first one here, which is our me first metabolic genetic cause, which is vitamin B6 deficiency. This is a pretty rare condition, but it's satisfying to diagnose and treat essentially giving these babies vitamin B6 will stop the seizures instantly, and they could be completely normal if you make that cause, if you've discovered that very quickly. Um, the next couple of days, we have more concerns about an actual stroke in babies. That's another topic altogether, but stroke is relatively common, all things considered. Um, various bleeding, as well as the first here of a cerebral dysgenesis or a brain malformation. These are common reasons that we see intractable seizures in young babies. Um, various, again, other genetic conditions. And then the right side of the slide move forward for three days to a week. Now we start to see some other genetic conditions, some other metabolic disorders, um, things that you really need to know about that are potentially treatable. And moving on to the one to four week at the end of this neonatal period, Again, we have listed adrenal leukodystrophy, a genetic cause. Again, structural changes in the brain, the dysgenesis, as well as other concerning metabolic diseases that can be picked up and treated somewhat effectively. So there is clear data now about what babies have these problems, and you can kind of see what things look for. So birth weight is clearly a risk factor. So our most premature infants are, as a group, going to be much more likely to require the uh, services of a neurologist and have a seizure problem. So below 1.5 kilograms, you can see about 5% of those babies will have some sort of seizures early on. And as you get larger, the number goes down to about 3 per 1,000. And then your prematurity is a big risk factor as well. Why we have many, many babies who are term who have seizures, that's usually because of the HIE condition. If you look as a group and normalize for the numbers, if you're less than 30 weeks, it has about 4% incidence of seizures, whereas more than that, only about half that risk, about 1.5%. So the youngest, smallest babies are definitely going to be at risk. 
they have neonatal seizures for different reasons. Um, I'm going to spend a little more time because HIE is so important worldwide. Again, the lawyers have a different view of this United States than the physicians, but we're still working on that. Um, there's definitely examples where something happened to a mother and a child right now, you know, and that will cause many problems. An example of that would be abruptio placenta. That is a clear time where there was a moment when blood flow and oxygen ceased to flow to that baby's brain. There's many other causes that happen very early in gestation. The modern view is that most HIE probably happen first or second trimester earlier in a pregnancy due to some problem with either inflammation or infection, which we still don't understand, and those babies' brains had an injury, and then later on they tend to have difficult deliveries because those babies don't move well because they had an early brain injury. This is a more evolving view, meaning we've thought this for 20 years, but again, it's still getting down to the lawyers. If there's any attorneys in the audience, I apologize. I doubt there are, but uh, we have to have a different way of approaching these things. Um, other causes besides HIE and bottom of the slide, various hemorrhages can certainly cause many problems with seizures, <coughs> excuse me, and different trichular and periventricular issues for sure in the preterm population. And again, as you get into older children, you see much more from deliveries of either subarachnoid or subdural hematomas, which can cause obviously seizures and which should prompt an imaging evaluation of these babies too. Uh, and I mentioned this trauma right now, which can also cause stroke as well with cortical vein thromboses and a huge list of infections that any of these that would involve the brain can certainly cause seizures because of that issue. Um, the most important ones there are probably beta hemolytic streptococcus as well as various viruses, torch infections, et cetera. Um, again, huge list of possible causes, which I call metabolic genetic because most metabolic diseases generally are genetic as well. As we get more and more sophisticated with screens and be able to identify these patients very early, hopefully they'll translate to better therapies. But things to look out for which will cause seizures for sure are hypoglycemia, which we'll hear about more about during this conference. Um, hypomagnesium and hyponatremia are easy things to check and fix in babies. Uh, inborn errors in metabolism, less easy to fix but still approachable as well as, again, the paradox in your B6 deficiency, and this is a good question for any sort of board. Coming up, the gene that causes this called ALDH7A1. Again, this is a nice thing to know about because while it's quite rare, I've only seen two or three in my career, you can completely treat these patients effectively and they're normal if you give them early vitamin B6, which is cheap and easy. So, important things. Uh, other causes of neonatal seizures. I mentioned the dysgenesis of the brain, so overall name of malformations of cerebral development. It should not be surprising if a brain did not form normally. You can have seizures as a result, and that's again usually why someone like me would get involved. Examples listed there are just various types of cerebral malformations, either polymicrogyria or heterotopias, or abnormalities of neuronal migration. Lysencephaly, or overall smooth brain, and holoprosencephaly are very early, very genetic conditions where the brain just failed to form. These generally have fairly poor outcomes where the patients with polymicrogyria and hyertopias will have epilepsy may, but may or may not have developmental severe anomalies. The neurocutaneous syndromes deserve a talk of their self. The most important in my view is tuberous sclerosis, which is seen about one in 6,000 live births worldwide. In the United States, we have a lot of problems with this. Patients who go through withdrawals of various illicit drugs and toxic exposures that then cause seizures or seizure-like concerns as these patients withdraw. A very interesting condition, again, because you can be smart as a provider and tell the family what's going on. There's something that used to be called fifth day fits by the British, so early the first week of life, you would start to have these fits or seizures. A more modern name is benign familial neonatal seizures. It's called benign because these people grow out of their seizures and then are normal human beings with normal development. And the most modern view of it is a mutation in a potassium channel called KCNQ2, which if mutated will cause this phenotype of neonatal seizures and then presumably because other potassium channels later in life become important, it goes away. So if you can identify this condition, and it's usually a, fa a family history because it's familial. Um, it's a nice diagnosis to make because, again, it has a happy ending, as you like to say. So there are many types of seizure classifications for neonates. I apologize, my formatting's wrong here. 
but uh, they can be very unusual and it can be challenging to make the diagnosis. Uh, some of the points I will uh, share with you is that big focal jerking type seizures um, are a little easier to figure out. Babies are not supposed to ever have generalized tonic-clonic or grand mal seizures because their myelination patterns do not permit such seizures. So whenever I'm called for a generalized tonic-clonic seizure in a baby, I'm suspicious. But they can have clonic seizures, and they can definitely have tonic or stiff seizures as well, isolated. The subtle patterns, which again can be challenging, are apnea by itself, which is very unusual. I'll mention that again. But one of the pearls is to look for abnormal eye movements. Babies who have focal eye movements, looking to one side, jerking the stagmoid movements, raises the risk of seizures considerably. The pedaling movements in the legs and arms, people talk about the bicycling, can be seizure, but it's not always. <coughs> Excuse me again. And then this is just a list of some of the associations with different seizure types to the etiology, to the prognosis. This is where neurologists like to organize things and try to predict better. Um, and then one, just one example, tonic seizures can often be seen with interventricular hemorrhage. And those are generally are not good things, not because they're tonic seizures, but because the cause itself of interventricular hemorrhage is not a good thing. The multifocal clonic seizures is a classic presentation of HIE. And we have EEGs, I'll show you an example. We can see this very readily. Um, other ones listed are there, but I wanted to just point out that if babies who have apnea by itself, in my experience, is rarely seizure, but sometimes it is, so we get a lot of calls about it, but to increase the yield of the diagnosis, apneic spells with tonic deviation of the eyes, again, to one side or up or something like that, is actually usually a seizure in my experience, and apneic spells with tachycardia sometimes, so it's hard to know, but the point is that don't, um, dismiss apnea by itself as not seizure, but it's pretty low likelihood. Look for associated signs, other neurologic manifestations that help with the yield. So here's an example of a real patient. Uh, it was a 39-week gestation, so term, now several weeks old, has cardiac anomalies, a tosig bing issue, and we have a large cardiothoracic uh, program in our hospital, and we have a lot of complications of the brain post-repair because of all the things that have to be done for cardiac repair. Now there is a concern for seizure activity, and that concern in our cardiac ICU is either abnormal movement, breathing pattern, something like that. But we have a fairly high index of concern for these young babies who have cardiac surgeries. So one thing we'll do very quickly is to get an EEG, because we have resources and we're very fortunate that we can get EEGs fairly easily. But I can tell you also, getting an EEG on a baby, the youngest baby, and reading the EEG on the youngest baby is a very significant resource challenge for my hospital in the United States. It's because it involves a lot of people and equipment, and getting it read quickly and doing the right thing has always been a challenge. This is a normal baby as a comparison. I don't expect anyone here, or hardly anyone here, to be a neonatal EEG reader. It's a skill unto itself. But this is just a normal pattern to contrast with the seizure I'll show you next. This baby has a typical pattern of a focal seizure with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. The channels up top in different colors just refer to heart rate and breathing patterns and movements, and that's why if someone does have apnea, we can actually see it recorded on the EEG. We can see the apnea, we can see whether these brain channels here are associated with the seizure. I just want to point out, and I think everyone should be able to see very easily, that there's a rhythmicity here in this part of the page. Each interval here is about one second of time. So over this approximately eight seconds, this is the beginning of a seizure. The next 10 seconds are shown here. It's pretty easy to see this part of the brain marching along, spike, 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 and the baby has an associated clinical jerking of one part of their body, in this case, their left arm. And though here, it's spreading a little bit as well. And the next 10 seconds, it'll intensify and spread to involve the entire brain and then here it will stop. When we have someone with HIE, they'll have a typical style like this, will have 30 of these seizures a day, and they'll come from the left side of the brain, the right side of the brain. So the whole brain is involved in this process. Whereas if you had a, pro a patient who had a cerebral dysgenesis, that's more often a focal abnormality of the brain, which then correlates with focal seizures. So just by looking at the EEG, how intense the patterns are and where the seizures are coming from, the neurologist can give a fairly good bit of information about what's going on, how aggressive to be, and going from there. 
So it gets us to management. So obviously neonatal seizures are bad, require urgent treatment. In our hospital protocol, we would certainly give a benzodiazepine as the first um, level drug. There is active controversy right now about how these medications should be used because the GABAergic system, the inhibitory neurons of the brain are not mature in babies. And some people argue through animal models that these actually may be causing more harm than good. It's hard to know. Clinical studies are ongoing to assess this. But nonetheless, the current standard is still to use a benzodiazepine to increase GABA tone in the baby's brain. We would typically then load with either levetiracetam, Keppra, or phenobarbital. They have different mechanisms of action. So we may use one first and then the other if the seizures continue. And then phenytoin is used typically in our hospital as a secondary agent. And if they have HIE, these patients will see CCs. We throw in a lot of medications at them. And then as the brain, as we say, cools off, um, the seizures abate, and then the child's medications are usually weaned somewhat. But these are very aggressive epilepsies to take care of, require a lot of intensive resources. We think it's critical you have an EEG for this, at least a one-hour study to understand, and we prefer to have a continuous EEG study. And then I can tell you, when I walk into our hospital in the morning and there are seven babies, with continuous EEGs, it really stresses our system completely just to read them and keep track of them and manage them. So this is a, a good thing to have the resources, but we still struggle, as every hospital does, of how to use resources appropriately. Um, I'm just going to mention in passing the idea that babies with HIE who are term in our hospital usually get a cooling protocol. So pretty good studies have been done, probably discussed this conference in the past, where cooling the baby's brain or body can certainly help outcomes. It's not a tremendous advantage, but babies often go from a severe outcome to a moderate outcome or a moderate to more mild. So it's something we do, but again, it involves a lot of resources for the cooling and the monitoring, and the EEG is done typically with those patients at all time as well. So this is an emerging therapy. Uh, Dr. Guthrie, I believe, last year gave a talk about erythropoietin as a treatment as well for hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. But the bottom line is we require many better therapies, more information to better manage these patients. Because these young seizures, we think, are not good for a developing brain, and I say that because we know that many of these patients go on to have lifelong epilepsy or at least during development and their childhood, which usually correlates strongly with problems with overall uh, life and ability to have a job, education, marry, et cetera. So uh, about 20% of all these patients that we see do have some form of postnatal epilepsy. And most of them start having more seizures, diagnosed epilepsy, in the first half of their life, first year, half of the year of their life. And then if they have different causes, such as perinatal asphyxia, at least 30% of those patients, again, will have epilepsy. And this last point is not surprising, but if your brain was not formed properly from the get-go, that's not going away. You're going to probably have epilepsy, not 100%, but a majority of those patients will have seizures most of their life, and we have to be more aggressive with those patients as well. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.